Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another uh, episode of Danish TV's English language uh, TV station and the global voice of the Center for Islam and Decoloniality. And as usual, we try to bring you some of the uh, most uh, brilliant speakers that we can uh, on the show that offers insights that we rarely get from the uh, mainstream uh, media, either here, Pakistan, in the West, and so on. Uh, and uh, today, I'm incredibly uh, delighted to have uh, two guests that are speaking, that will be speaking on a subject that is incredibly uh, relevant right now uh, to Pakistanis, to throughout the Islamic hate world, and for that matter, throughout the world. Um, and that is the question of normalization, recognizing uh, the state of Israel. Uh, there has been, as many of us in Pakistan know, uh, whether in Pakistan and other Islamic aid societies, uh, a position historically of, of not recognizing uh, the state of Israel uh, because of the, the crimes that it has committed against the Palestinians and so on. And Pakistan has, been, ha has had that position. However, we are seeing developments take place within the, particularly in the Gulf region, but now extending to Sudan, to Morocco, and so on. And in particular, uh, for our purposes, uh, of course, uh, we have a viewership, we have global viewership, uh, and we have a Pakistani viewership. So both for our guests, uh, uh, Dr. Saad Abu Khalil and Hoeda Raf, who I'll introduce briefly. Dr. Saad Abu Khalil is a professor of political science and Middle Eastern politics at uh, University of California, Stanislaus. And Hawaii Araf is one of the pioneers of the international solidarity movement uh, that she co-founded. Again, putting the, uh, the, I the, 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 the ideas around uh, uh, confronting uh, the, the Zionist uh, uh, the crimes and their propaganda within the United States by actually putting together uh, a, 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 some, a praxis, some type of praxis for uh, people within, within the United States, throughout the world, etc., to go and directly express solidarity with the Palestinians in whatever way that they can. So an incredible uh, movement that she co-founded, and uh, Weda Raf is, is a lawyer based in the U.S. Um, and so um, it's, it's an honor for me to have both of you on the program today. And the topic is just uh, so so pertinent and, and relevant that I am trying to do as many shows as I can on this, um, even though this is uh, not my normal role, you know, to, to, to do this. But but I but the issue is so relevant right now and and dangerously relevant right now to the Pakistan to, to the Pakistani people, uh, to the Palestinians, um, and to all of those people, justice-seeking people in the world. Uh, this this question of normalization uh, with Israel. So I want to get straight into it uh, and, and not waste too much time in, 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 in this, in, in speaking about it, because I think uh, uh, certainly our Pakistani viewership and, um, and our guests and our international um, viewership uh, know, kind of have a sense of the developments taking place uh, in, in with regard to this whole uh, process of normalizing normalizing Israel by what now is actually being very commonly called, I mean, you know, Arab and Muslim uh, Zionist uh, <laughs> regimes. Uh, so, anyways, I want to get right into it. Uh, my first question to uh, to the both of you um, is uh, the question that uh, uh, that people just want in terms of uh, a very clear answer. Uh, the argument uh, of why not, uh, why should a country, any country, whether it's Pakistan uh, or, you know, any other country in the world, whether Islamic it, in the Islamic world, non-Islamic world, etc., why should they not recognize and normalize relations with Israel? Um, Hoeda, if, if, if you don't mind, if I can start with you um, on this question. Sure. And and thank you for having me and for doing this program, which, as you mentioned, runs counter to the programs that you usually do, because it is such a critical topic. And I commend you also for bringing Palestinians on, because that is what 
is not being um, the, the position of the Palestinians is not being sought out in this effort to normalize relations with Israel. And Palestinians are not opposed to normalizing with the Jewish people or with Israel when Israel abides by international law and starts respecting the human rights of the Palestinian people. And I think your prime minister said it best when he said that conditions of bilateral ties with Israel would have to wait for a just settlement which satisfies Palestinians. So you need a, a settlement, an end to the brutal policies that Israel has been inflicting for over seven decades on the Palestinian people, the colonization of our land, the occupation policies that deprive people of, of a dignified life, and not only dignified, but really of the ability to live and which satisfies Palestinians. So Palestinians have to be a part of this equation. And Palestinians have clearly come out in opposition to normalization with Israel as long as Israel continues to occupy and colonize the Palestinian people. And yet Palestinians are completely ignored, which is uh, immoral and unjust. If we're just going to look at one aspect, one aspect of what Israel is doing, uh, let's look at the Gaza Strip. I mean, a UN report a few years ago said Gaza would be unlivable by 2020. Mm -hmm. And now 2020 is basically come and gone and no one is paying attention. Not a thing has changed. Over 2 million people are imprisoned by Israel in the Gaza Strip. They suffer from the most basic needs like drinkable water, it, electricity is cut off for more than half the day. Most people have electricity for only four to six hours a day. That's including hospitals. I mean, how do you run uh, a, an incubator? How do you perform surgery with no electricity? Medicines that Israel does not allow in, uh, nutrition, everything that enters and exits the Gaza Strip is controlled by Israel and Israel doesn't care. They, and living only a few minutes away are Israelis which enjoy a high who enjoy a high standard mm -hmm. of living with full access to like, the finest health care nutrition clean water um while palestinians remain in these in the squalid condition as a deliberate policy of israel to bring palestinians to their knees this is not a life gaza is unlivable and the world doesn't care and israel doesn't change, doesn't do anything about it, doesn't end these policies because there have been no consequences on, mm -hmm. on Israel. And so that's why the Palestinian people, civil society called for a global movement to isolate Israel, to put pressure on Israel that would lead to the end of these policies and to Palestinian freedom and liberation. And at a time when global civil society is paying attention and almost every other day we mm -hmm. see more another group, another union, another university that has taken action to boycott or divest from Israel. You have Arab and Muslim countries moving in the opposite mm. opposite direction. That is really shameful, shameful. And the entire world needs to isolate Israel like we isolated apartheid South Africa until the apartheid regime collapsed. And that's what we need. Israel's racist colonial regime to collapse so that we can build a, a society where all people are treated equally and live with their human rights and dignity respected. And thanks so much, Awena, for that. And especially the, the earlier point you made, the utter absence in this entire process, whether it's the so-called peace accords between countries that have not even had, have gone to war with each other, say the UAE and, 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 and Israel, but the utter absence of all of this, the Kushner plan, this, that, of Palestinians themselves, um, whether it's, it's, it's in those forums or even whether he, sometimes even in, in progressive forums, we see the utter absence of kind of the voices of, 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 of Palestinians. And, uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm glad that, that you brought that up. I think that that is central to this, that all of these things are happening without actually pal any, any representation from the Palestinians, no matter what specific faction or that uh, from the Palestinian people. But, but thank you for, for that, uh, those initial remarks, Oweda. Uh, Professor Saad Abu Khalid? say that the debate that is happening in Pakistan right now is being closely watched in the Arab world uh, because they are aware uh, of the very long history of Pakistani solidarity with the Palestinian people, regardless of the stances of successive Pakistani government, especially military dictatorships that have been very much uh, under the dictates of 
the United States administration and the Zionist lobby in Washington, D.C. The fact that Pakistan, not even under General Musharraf, uh, did not normalize with the state of Israel is a testimony yeah. to the steadfast support exhibited by the Pakistani people for Palestinian struggle. I mean, I've been to Pakistan, as you know, and I've written in Arabic how I have more faith or I have as much faith in the Pakistani people uh, rejection of the state of Israel as much as I do with the bulk of Arab public opinion. Uh, I want to say first that uh, I believe that normalization with Israel now or at any time is absolutely immoral and inconsistent with the minimum basis of justice for the Palestinian people and, e and even the Arab people. There are so many arguments against normalization. We can begin by saying, I mean, as Weda said, I mean, this is an upper side regime, very indistinguishable in its structure from the South African upper side regime. And let us remember that these two upper sides were very close allies and collaborated in the manufacture of a nuclear uh, weapon. Uh, to dismantle the apartheid system of Zionism in Palestine is an important essential uh, requirement for justice in Palestine and the Middle East. For that, it should be rejected at all costs. But more than that, I mean, there is something about the Pakistani national security interest. I mean, in my own lifetime, I mean, the Israeli state has not only inflicted harm and dispossession on the Palestinian people. In my own lifetime, I am now 60 years old, uh, Israel has bombed not only Palestine throughout, not only Palestinian refugee camps everywhere in the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in West Bank and Gaza. I mean, it even in 1975 incinerated literally a Palestinian refugee camp in South Lebanon called the Nabatiya refugee camp. It doesn't exist anymore because it was bombed to smithereen by the Israeli uh, uh, government. Uh, so there is the element of how extensive Israeli bombing has been. In my lifetime, Israel has bombed the Palestinian people as well as Sudan, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, uh, as well as in 1973, it downed a Libyan civilian airliner. Not to mention the scores of crimes, assassinations, bombings around the world that were targeting Palestinian civilians or non-civilians, because as we know, Israel does not make a distinction. So any normalization with Israel is an invitation for mm -hmm. the penetration of Pakistani society and its basic security by the Mossad, which is something we have seen in Egypt and elsewhere in any state that normalized with the state of Israel. The third element of the argument is the fact that all the promises of the rewards of normalization have proven to be false. I mean, Egypt normalized with Israel in 1979, Jordan in 1994, and they were both told that this normalization is going to bring prosperity and bliss to the people of both countries. And none of that ever happened. What we know it does, normalization basically leads to the consolidation of dictatorships in all the countries, Arab and Islamic, that normalize with Israel, because Israel and America know that the only way to impose normalization on a people is by ensuring that they are ruled uh, with the iron fist by a government that is loyal to the United States and the Israeli lobby. And this has been the case in Egypt, in Jordan, and now we see that in uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, even though it's not been announced by Saudi Arabia, and Morocco as well. But many of those countries have collaborated with Israel for many decades, mm. beginning from the 1960s. That's true of Saudi Arabia. That is true of uh, Morocco. Um, but the reason why now they are coming out publicly, announcing the normalization, I mean, one is to please the United States, and two, because they basically now feel it is a requirement in order to obtain the weapons they need to keep their people oppressed. So it is a recipe for the continuation of oppression by people anywhere that normalize with the state of Israel. Uh, I should also say that uh, the Jordanian people are still now in need of foreign aid to live. The Egyptian mm. people, the state of poverty has not diminished over the years, if anything. I mean, the Egyptian people were doing much better in the 1960s and even 50s when there was a declared war against the state of Israel than mm -hmm. they are doing now under the conditions of peace. What the United States does is to provide aid and weapons to the Egyptian government and the Jordanian government in order to keep the people uh, you know, quiet and silent. In the case of UAE and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, of course, I mean, these are the total oppressive government 
where a tweet can get you a 15-year sentence uh, if you disagree with the government and its foreign policy. So what we're seeing in the UAE now is more success of uh, declared and uh, normalization imposed on society because unlike Pakistan and unlike Egypt and Jordan, there is no history in those countries for any civic organization or political mm -hmm. organizations that have proven to be uh, important to prevent society in Egypt and Jordan from exhibiting any signs of acceptance for the state of Israel. Right, right, right. right. Uh, uh, the, the only the thing, thing uh, I'll, I'll add to that, that uh, Professor Asad, is that, um, is that um, of course, uh, it does earn these uh, these regimes that do normalize the the label of of being moderate Arab regimes that are on a reformist path when they do normalize with Israel. So this is the, the common kind of uh, thing, at least for the regimes themselves. But you're absolutely right. What does it deliver to the Egyptian people, to the Jordanians and so on? Uh, you're absolutely right on that. Before I, I go to the, the final question, again, uh, how do we continue what, what Hoveda had referred to earlier in terms of uh, our ongoing resistance uh, to to the to the Zionist entity and and its criminality against the Palestinians. I did want to dig a little bit deeper into uh, what uh, Professor Saad Khalil was speaking about uh, uh, the, the the motivations of this normalization process in the Arab world. Of course, you mentioned that this has been the, the ties have been uh, with Israel uh, per, for for quite a while now. But but if you a little bit deeper analysis of kind of why what what, what is their motivation in 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 doing this right now? Um, I think that's on the minds of, of many people that all of a sudden why are we having this urgency to do that? Um, Weda or Saad, either one. Where would you start? I uh, sure. Well, uh, as uh, Professor Abu Khalil noted, uh, these relationships have been ongoing for a long time. Now, what is mm. the motivation for coming public with them? I think it is, I think also uh, Dr. Abu Khalil noted, pressure from the United States and incentives from the United States mm. uh, that is you know, based on each country, for example, Morocco recognizing its occupation uh, over the Sahara, uh, the Western Sahara yeah. for the UAE, it's a more weapons deal that is going to, you know, continue the UAE's ability to in inflict un unimaginable oppression and killing on the people of Yemen. And with each country is different. Now we're hearing also with Indonesia, the United States is promising a one to two mm. billion aid package. Uh, Sudan also taking them off the, the US terror list, which would, it, greatly help uh, Sudan with its economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, desperation and crisis. And so, it, and why is the United States doing this? Uh, really, the Trump administration, one of the most obvious, the Trump administration has been the most corrupt, uh, probably in the history of the United States. Uh, President Trump did put in place, when it comes to the Middle East, people that are not only uh, sympathetic to Israel, but are pro-Israel, pro the settler movement, whether his uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, or his, uh, you know, ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, that have been longtime supporters of the settler movement and that believe in a greater Israel and just want to get rid of the Palestinian people. And these people have been pushing for policies that benefit Israel. So here's President Trump wanting to give uh, Israel everything that it wants. And part of it is pushing these Arab countries to normalize, to further isolate the Palestinian people, to get rid, to weaken the Palestinian people in their very legitimate um, liberation struggle. And so that is very, mm -hmm. and, and as you said, you know, those countries that are mobilizing for a possible benefit is for them to be able to say that they are moderate. I think that we should come out and strongly push the view that they are not, they are moving against the trend to be moderate, to be peace loving is to be pro human rights. And what's happening now, legitimizing Israel's colonization and oppression and dispossession of the Palestinian people, that is that is extremist. That is an extremist yeah. position to have. And that is the position that we need to continue pushing. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I think it's very clear from the record of Arab normalization with Israel that the United States has not been able to find except despots to normalize with Israel. Democratizing mm. countries in the Middle East are not able to normalize with Israel for the simple reason that the popular opinion counts in those countries. I mean, public opinion in Saudi Arabia and UAE and Bahrain doesn't count. 
the, the mm. government rule with total disregard of the wishes of the population, and they have ruled as such from the time of colonial powers put them in their thrones. Uh, in Sudan, for example, I mean, the military is still in charge, despite what is called an uprising and revolution last year. Right. The military is in charge, and it is the one that entered into this bargain with the United States, but it's not going smoothly. I mean, the people of Sudan has made it very clear that they are opposed to that. Tunisia is one of the most uh, democratizing Arab countries, as well as Lebanon, and those two are very steadfast in rejection of any normalization with the state of Israel. Why now? One. The Trump administration, lacking any achievements, wants to uh, have a signature achievement that they know will be uploaded by Western Zionist media as well by the U.S. Congress and both parties. Anything related to Israel would get applause. And they were right about that. We do not, we did not see any criticism of the normalization process and even the price of it by any of the Democrats in Congress. Uh, two, despots need normalization to buy whatever they wish for, uh, uh, for their militaries. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, tools of oppression and tools of aggression. Uh, look, I mm -hmm. mean, the deal between UAE and the United States entailed the sale of F-35s to the government of UAE. And as we know, the Israeli lobby has to approve arms sale to any Middle Eastern countries. So this is why they wanted to normalize with Israel. Three, normalization with Israel opens the markets of the countries to tools of oppression. There mm -hmm. is very close security or cooperation between Israel, the Mossad, and many of these intelligence services in the Middle East. So it's going to be at the expense of the population. The fourth reason why normalization is happening now is because uh, the Saudi axis in the region, this most reactionary, misogynistic, anti-Semitic uh, you know, uh, uh, axis of the region, mm -hmm. wants to cultivate a new hatred for a new enemy, and that is Iran. And for right. that, they want to uh, displace people's detestation uh, to Israel to direct all the hatred, all the opposition against Iran. And for that, they want to welcome Iran, as Israel into their midst to render an occupation apartheid state as one of uh, basically Arab countries. And that's the intention. That's the ultimate intention. I mean, this was in yeah. fact the agenda of the Moroccan king, not this one, his father. He wanted to uh, invite Israel into Arab countries. I mean, as if, <laughs> They share an Arab identity or Arab uh, aspiration and so on. Right, right. Uh, and uh, Professor Saad Abu Ghalil, I, I'm so glad you brought up uh, the issue of Iran because uh, this has been also an issue that that, the, that Pakistan, the Pakistani government has right. been confronting. Uh, right. it, it, has, it has tried to improve dramatically the relationship that it has uh, had historically because of pressure from the Saudis and so on, has not had good relations with Iran. But now it is under the Prime Minister Imran Khan. Uh, more visits between the, uh, the the Prime Ministers, the Foreign Ministers, etc., than right. ever before in the history of the country. Right. And and that has been bothering the Saudis very much. Uh, so much so, the famous Kuala Lumpur summit, etc., a day before Prime Minister Imran Khan is summoned by MBS and told not to go. It, right. I was afraid that he, he was going to be kidnapped like the Lebanese Prime Minister and, right. uh, so, and, and, and be, uh, be forced to resign. Thankfully, he was not. But, uh, and, and I warned him not to go again. So, but the, but the, the, the thing is that I think you hit the nail on the head with that. And, and I think that in, in Pakistan uh, right now, that that, that that is the fear. That it's it's both uh, it's both a carrot and a stick policy that's going on. Uh, the, the, but the, the carrot, being, but the carrot yeah. is a false promise. I mean, the yeah. carrot is a mirage. And I think what the people of Pakistan should realize: this is not only about support for the Palestinian people who have been suffering since 1948 and even before that. This is about the struggle for democracy in Pakistan itself. Yes. I mean, the United States and the Israeli lobby do not want the people of Pakistan to have the right to elect their own representative, to have their voice in government. And this is why the tool of this process, the pressure on Pakistan, is going to take the shape through the military and intelligence apparatus, because I think it may cost uh, Imran Khan his uh, position in government. I mean, that's how desperate the Israeli lobby is to obtain normalization with the state of Pakistan. And the Saudis, by the way, are leading the effort because Saudi Arabia wants to have historically significant Muslim and Arab countries like Pakistan, like Indonesia, to lead a normalization because Saudi Arabia is afraid of being uh, blamed for joining a process that is against the wishes of the Arab and Muslim people. And this is why Pakistan has become so important. And this right. is why the 
struggle of the people of Pakistan against normalization has repercussion, not only in Pakistan, but throughout the region itself. Yes, co completely agreed. And, and, and what, you, what you said, uh, yes, it, it will be basically, uh, the, the, the carrot is, is buying off a section of the establishment of the elites, etc., cetera, uh, to normalize. The stick, of course, we have also known is, is there's been threats to deport Pakistani laborers and right. all of these right. things. Uh, uh, you know, these types of threats nonstop. And I also think that uh, you are very uh, astute when you observe that many Pakistanis share that sentiment, that the, that the, uh, the cost of, of, of normalizing with Israel would, pro would probably be, be our prime minister, uh, Imran Khan. That's a very astute observation. The final uh, question that I did want to ask, uh, what I mentioned earlier, is what do we do now uh, in, 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 when these Gulf regimes, incredible you know, wealth and, and, and money aligned with the United States, uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, now getting the Israeli and the intelligence and security, kind of all of that, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, that, that relationship, what is what is the way forward? Because I, I think Hueda put it best that on the one hand, you do see uh, a global solidarity movement, which is which is which is quite impressive that has been emerging uh, with the Palestinian people on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you see the conditions that are just abysmal uh, within the occupied territories itself and this on top of it, this normalization process. So. Uh, the question I'll ask to both of you, I hope it's not too difficult, is what do we do? What, 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 what do we do or what do we continue doing in, in order to resist this? Do you want to go first this time? No, oh, no, Huayda, go ahead. I mean, you have such a, uh, you know, uh, important experience in organization activism. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, it, it is not in easy question, especially when it comes to, to Pakistan, because there aren't a lot of um, relations, like uh, public relations and, uh, and economic and other businesses, like for example, the United States, where we can uh, mobilize to boycott and divest um, from Israel. But what I would urge is for Pakistan to stay on the right side of history um, and, not, and not to normalize, stay uh, on the side of the people that are demanding and rising up across borders, uh, across issues for this kind of global solidarity for, for justice for all people. And in the United States, I know, and in other countries, we are building these alliances with social justice movements because we believe in a world where people uh, live free and have their human rights respected. And that is a movement that is growing. And I think, uh, Today, it's obvious, but history will more clearly show that these regimes that uh, normalized um, it really sided with not only occupation and oppression, but I would say also it's not too extreme to say we're complicit in genocide because that's what, you know, you mentioned that I am a lawyer, international human rights lawyer, and the definition of genocide is you can see it in what Israel is doing and this is happening and you do not want to side with that. Although it seems like these uh, regimes that are normalizing have money and have power and so what are we going to do? We're going to stand against all odds with people and with human rights and for what's right. And therefore, I think just these expressions of solidarity, it doesn't have to be going over to Palestine. It doesn't have to be standing in front of an Israeli soldier. It doesn't even have to be, uh, you know, through an organization or through a donation or through mm -hmm. something that is um, uh, physically tangible. Palestinians take so much a moral support from knowing that people see and hear them and have not abandoned them. And to, to Palestinians mm. looking around to these uh, Arab and Muslim states that are normalizing, it's just a, f a sense of abandonment, which makes you feel yeah. uh, like you're almost powerless. And it takes away a lot of, um, it takes away hope. But knowing that people are standing strong and see and hear and and, and share this with them. And we have so many means of communication these days with social media, et cetera. That means a lot. So seeing the Palestinian flag lifted at a local demonstration, seeing a uh, chance for a free Palestine in, you know, a, a, at a soccer stadium, Palestinians really welcome this. Uh, and it gives 
them uh, a hope and fortification, really. I mean, we're not going to abandon the struggle, but it helps to know that uh, people have not abandoned us also. And so that's what I would ask of Pakistan and of the Pakistani people to continue expressing the solidarity in, in whatever ways you can and don't think that any way is, um, is, is minor. It counts. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, the, 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 the one point that uh, I, I will emphasize is that, as, as probably you two know, and our viewership knows that uh, uh, that the Prime Minister Imran Khan and the Pakistani government in general has, has taken a very firm position on what India has been doing in Kashmir, uh, which is really, at this stage, it is adopting from the playbook of the Israelis. Now it has become not just a, br a brutal military occupation, but now it's turning into settler colonialism. And uh, coordination with Israel. I mean, yes, there's a huge yes. honeymoon between India and Israel, as we know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so yeah. I, I, in addition to what Huayda is saying, that if, if you want to take that position, I mean, it would be pure hypocrisy to, to speak about what's going on there and then to normalize the same thing and worse going on in, in, in Palestine. And <clears throat> But one thing, um, Professor Saad, before you, you, uh, you answer this question, is that... Um, uh, the uh, within uh, the, the uh, Pakistan and within other countries as well, uh, the uh, the response to kind of uh, the Israeli apartheid structure, etc., uh, for for quite a long while. Uh, of course, the U.S. Uh, the the Pakistani relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, what we what we must realize is that this past year or year and a half has been in the entire history of Pakistan-Saudi rela relationship. One can argue the 2015 decision of the Pakistanis not to enter directly with the Saudis in the war on Yemen was also right. a very major uh, 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 development. But but this year has been incredibly, uh, the relations have soured incredibly precisely because of uh, uh, some of these positions Imran Khan has taken. So uh, how do you see, what, what do you see as kind of uh, what we can do here in Pakistan to continue... Right resist this right. overwhelming pressure coming right. from the Gulf? Uh, I mean, look, uh, Junaid, I know enough about Pakistan to say I am really less worried about Pakistan than I am about <laughs> other Arab countries for a simple reason. I mean, can you imagine, let's say there is normalization. Can you imagine how scared the Israeli government would be to open an embassy in Islamabad, for example? I mean, it would be, it would be as far as they are concerned, as risky an endeavor as opening an embassy in Beirut, Lebanon. I mean, that's how the idea is so far-fetched, and that's how deep right. the people of Pakistan's feeling are about the Palestinian people, but ab about how yeah. the response should be. I mean, I can only share with the people of Pakistan the experiences of some Arab countries. Look at the Sudan, for example. Look at Morocco. In many of those countries, they formed anti-normalization committees and broad fronts. Look at the experience of the Sudan. In the Sudan, for example, we find communists and Islamists coming together in order to express opposition to normalization. Something like that is very concrete. But more significantly, I think the struggle against the pressures of normalization should be expressed uh, in terms that are historical. This is not mm. only about rejection of Israeli hegemony. This is mm. also about the people of Pakistan, about rejection of Western colonial power and their diktats. I mean, look what they did to Sudan. In the Sudan, the U.S. government went there and explicitly blackmailed the government that if you do not normalize, we will declare you a terrorist state and we will starve the people of the Sudan. I mean, they put it on those strike terms. I mean, they, have, they made no bones about it. I mean, something like that could happen in Pakistan. But remember, there are no rewards, I mean, ex unless we count the injuries and the pain of the Palestinian people as a reward. Uh, what there will be, of course, is more, uh, you know, impudence on the part of the Israeli government to commit more aggression and more war crimes for many years to come. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Professor Saad Abu Khalil. And I want to actually... Uh, 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 say that uh, I think I have finally, for the first time in history, kept to the time uh, that we were allotted. Uh, and but I, I did want to say uh, and and truly emphasize that to, tonight to our global viewership and our Pakistani viewership that we have two individuals that have been at the forefront in a very difficult country. You know where I've lived most of my life as well, uh, where Zionist uh, kind of 
disciplining of the discourse on 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 Palestine has been so intense, and I've experienced it. Uh, and where someone like Professor Saad Abu Khalil uh, speaks the way he does has made me admire his courage. And someone like Huweda Araf, who has started a concrete movement uh, for people to express solidarity um, in a country like the United States, where the Zionists are, have been so strong. Uh, it's just uh, a great honor and, and a privilege for me to yeah, have both of you. Can I add one point? Yes, yes, please, please. Because somebody please. just wrote a question. I want to make sure to have even one minute to answer it. He sure, asked sure. about the people of Saudi Arabia, whether they are opposed to normalization. And I want to yeah. reassure the viewer, let us not be unfair to the people of Saudi Arabia. They live under the most oppressive, repressive government in the entire Middle East region, and they have no voice. But if you look at public opinion surveys, as far as of last year by the Arab Center, we find there is absolutely documented evidence that the people of Saudi Arabia are as opposed to normalization as most of the Arab people. It is mm. untrue that the princes and the corrupt polygamous princes and royals of Saudi Arabia speak on behalf of the people of the country. Absolutely not. I mean, I know from touring around the United States and around the United Kingdom mm. speaking against Israel, how active Saudis, when they get the chance to be abroad, to be active and uh, outspoken against Israel. Very true. Very true. Exactly. And this is, in some ways, I also say this, the normalization in which uh, these countries, not, not the, uh, the, the slightly poorer countries like Sudan, etc., but these countries, this normalization process can only take place under police states. No doubt. Un, uh, uh, under no doubt. police states. That's uh, no where, where public opinion can completely be ignored. But no. again, thank you to both of you. Uh, you. for being on the show and yeah. for making the case against normalization, which 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 is our which is our agenda. We make we're unashamedly uh, uh, against normalization, and I think you two helped us tremendously by the uh, insights you gave us today. Thank you very much for being on thank the show. You. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.